Welcome to the Combat Intelligent Athlete Show, where we talk and punch our way through achieving peak performance on the mat, surviving the street, and how to take on the martial arts of everyday life and win. And now, here is your host, Coach Rodney King. Hey, Ray, can you hear me? Professor King. Hey, what's hey, up? can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you perfect, yeah, man. Yeah, good. Good. I don't. Technology, it either drives you crazy or it's excellent. Yeah, man. So, Ray Floro, the man, the legend, and the guy with knives. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that, that. But thank you anyway. <laughs> awesome, man. So, look, it's fantastic to chat to you. We haven't talked for, for some time. Uh, I thought what we could probably do is just jump straight into this. Oh, absolutely. No, absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. For, you know, for the people out there that are in the martial arts world and, you know, maybe been sleeping under a rock somewhere and don't know who you are, <laughs> right, maybe you yes. can kind of give them just a, a – a, I know it will take forever if you have to go through everything, but just like a really quick kind of bio background on who Ray Floro is. Okay, a uh, quick bio background. Started off with Goju Kai Karate, then I, I really wanted – knives and bladed weapons so i took up fencing because there was nothing else available in the 70s here then a relative put me on to the filipino martial arts which i didn't even know existed which actually specialized in weapons so it must be genetics and through people like ray galang uh i got introduced to edgar solite uh, Ma- Grandmaster Tony Diego, Master Christopher Ricketts, Master Romy Macapagal, and ultimately to the Grandmaster Antonio Illustrissimo, who had the family system called Calis Illustrissimo. From then, I mixed my fencing with the Filipino martial arts, and I came up with something called Fluoro Fighting Systems, which is a Filipino-based martial arts, but heavily influenced with fencing principles. Yeah, so that's that. That would be like my next question, right? Because that, I mean, that's a long, rich history, and I think like you know, many people, you you one of those included, is that you go through these experiences, you learn from all these different, um, if we can call them experts, and then ultimately you get to the point where you go, okay, I'm at this point now where I think I can put something together that really, I guess, epitomizes my own personality and my own my own approach to martial arts right so that's really what you've done so i would like to hear because you you just kind of hinted on that right i'd like to hear what makes your approach different because you were saying that you know it seems to be heavily influenced by fencing principles yes it is um one thing i should say that even though i came up with my own well system uh i'm I'm a big believer in putting in solid foundations If I get a student who's been doing, say, Taekwondo for, you know, a decade, I'd rather have that person uh, as a student than somebody who's done a little bit here, a little bit there, certification here, you know, a four-hour certification there, because it doesn't matter what martial arts you do, it's a solid foundation that uh, that is important. Now, with fencing, I did that for about uh, three to four years. And I just found out I was good at it, so I became a, a state champion. Uh, and the, the 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 distance and the timing that I took out of it, the attributes that I took out of that, to me, that is the key to what makes me successful now. So even though it's a sport-based system, even though in the streets it probably you know is not that applicable, the attributes that you get from that. The, that that sport was so valuable in translating it later into the Filipino martial arts. Mm. So yeah, so you know it's interesting that you say that because I was actually talking to somebody yesterday, and we were we basically ended up having a very similar conversation. Obviously, because you know my I guess my what I'm known for is crazy monkey defense, so it's more of a striking based program. I'm not really a, a weapons based person. Not to say that I don't have some of that knowledge, but it's not my expertise. But one of the things that we were talking about was this kind of constant debate that's out in the market 
martial arts world between street versus sport, right? So, you know, the street guys are like, yeah, well, that's sport and it would never go down like that in the street and so forth. And, you know, although there is some truth to that, I would say that the truth that they claim isn't as wide a gap as they would like it to to be. In actual fact, you kind of saying that, right? And that's the kind of thing that I've discovered is that ultimately, if you take, for example, like say, uh, if we just take boxing, for example, and we, we, you know, not to complicate things. Well, if I'm doing sparring with another person, that's the place where I'm learning things like timing, distancing, how to keep calm under fire, right? What it's like to hit a moving target, what it's, you know, what it's like to be hit. And, you know, unfortunately, sometimes when you're working from a just purely reality-based self-defense perspective, although you're building these scenarios, you're not necessarily necessarily developing those key attributes that are very important once you actually find yourself in a quote-unquote street situation. So what you're saying there is exactly that, right? You're saying that foundation, those quote-unquote attributes that you develop, say for example through fencing, is key to then being able to apply that across into a a more self-preservation kind of mindset. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Look, to learn how to punch, you've got to punch in the first place. You know, like, to, to me, like, you know, I'm a big fan of Crazy Monkey. I always have been. Always have been. But, you know, I look at Crazy Monkey, and it won't take much to weaponize that. You know, the, the, the motions are very much the same as what I do. And all you have to do is, again, change the distance. Because you've got a weapon, you don't stand as close. But the, the, the foundations that you use in Crazy Monkey boxing, you can convert that into a, a, a knife-based system quite easily. Um, in, in, in fact... Uh, some of my students do crazy monkey boxing and, you know, their movements translate readily into what I do. See, when I teach someone, I, I don't make flora fighting systems fit the person. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I don't make the person fit the system. I make my system fit them. So I look at them and the first thing I do is I actually spar them. I just say, look, put, the, put your helmet on. I just w- want to see how you move. And it's funny that... Because I do that, you find out, sure enough, what their temperament is, what their character is. You know, when, when, when somebody starts getting hit and uh, uh, all the facade falls off, you know, the true self comes out. And I, I really need to see that because I'm teaching knife or blades or whatever. I really need to see what the real character of this person is. And putting a helmet on and sparring him, you know, all the facade goes. So, but then you find out, okay, this guy prefers his left foot forward or this guy prefers his right foot forward, okay? This guy holds his hands high. This guy holds his hands low. And I don't change that because um, most of the time, a lot of my students already have a martial arts background. In fact, a lot of them are already martial arts instructors. So I take their foundation and then I just tweak it a little and their weapon system becomes theirs. So not one of my students actually move alike. If you see all my students all put together, they all move totally differently. But that's okay with me because in the end, their distancing and their timing is, is the same. How they deliver it is, is you know, what's different. Yeah, no, I love that. I think that's I think it's a fantastic philosophy. So one of the things that you were talking about there, because I totally agree, right? You know, if you really want to learn something about somebody, put them in a sparring environment. Um, I like the way that you kind of define it, right? Their temperament it shows up, right? And so all the facade kind of falls away. So would you say, because I guess... I guess there's a lot of, uh, you know, when I look at the world of, say, weapons training, I mean, there, there are people that, that I respect like you, and then there are other people where I look at it and I'm, mm, and one of the things that oftentimes stands out for me is the temperament that they seem to advocate. So my, I guess my question to you is, you know, bearing all that in mind that you kind of, you know, allow people to kind of develop their own way through your system, right? The, the timing and distancing is the same, which I get. But would you say that there is a, uh, a preferred temperament in the world of using weapons that is more preferable to another. So the reason I'm saying that, so let me preface this, that is that oftentimes what k- tends to be put out there is that this hyper-aggressive killer instinct kind of approach. So I'm kind of trying to figure out where you see yourself within that and what would you say is, a, is probably the, the better temperament to have? Because we, you know, we are using weapons and ultimately you know, the consequences of making a mistake is, is massive. The... the, the, the 
the temperament that you need with weapons is to control your temperament. I mean, there are a lot of, um, and the, this is where the weapon-based system is always unrealistic. How can we spar weapon-based system realistically? I, I can't. I can't have a real knife, and my student have a real knife, and we go at it. There's no way we can do it. One will. One, one will die. So what we do is we, we we use padded sticks. We use padded knives. We use armor. Now the thing is. If I slash you across the arm, will that stop you? I don't know. See, we've, I've never tried it. Or if I, I slash you across the belly, will that stop you? I don't know. I don't know if you're drugged up or not. See, we will never find out. At least with boxing, you can really test your skills. You can knock the guy out. With BJJ, you can really test your skills. But how can you really test your skills with knife on knife or machete against machete? So... What we do then is, I guess, the, the unrealistic thing, if I hit you across the arms, well, you recognize that as a cut. But the thing is, with your nature or with your constitution, will you stop fighting then or will you still keep coming in? You know, if, if a BJJ guy goes, goes for a takedown and I manage to put a stab in, will that stop him? Well, I guess, you know, if you, if you hit, hit them lethally, it will stop them. But we will never know. That, that is the one unrealistic thing about weapons. You can't spar it with real weapons. But in terms of temperament, the problem we have, especially with uh, people from other martial arts doing our stuff is, say, for example, they're, they're into boxing or kickboxing or MMA. They're so used to getting hit that they will cover themselves and they'll get hit, and but they'll still keep coming in. Now, if I had a real knife, and they cover, and I stabbed, I stabbed them. Will they keep coming in? Well, chances are probably not. There are many times when I've get a student who's done MMA, and I will hit them four or five times before they make an entry, and then they'll they'll they'll, they'll hit me, and then so and and they'll think, oh, you know, well, I hit you. Well, you know what, mate? If if I've just stabbed you in the eye, I stabbed you in the neck. And I've, I've, I've slashed your arm, chances are you probably wouldn't get that shot in. Or if you do get that shot in, it wouldn't be as, as hard as a shot as if I didn't cut you. So, um, so with my guys, we are mindful that what we have is not a stick, is a bladed weapon. Hence, if there is a blow that strikes you, it's, it's up to the person getting hit to be honest and realistic about it. Would that have taken me out or would, have, would that have disabled my weapon hand, etc.? But again, we'll never know because we never use real weapons. Yeah. So I guess like erring on the kind of side of caution, then it makes kind of sense to have a temperament that is more centered and less kind of fueled up on that kind of hyper aggressive killer instinct mindset mindset. Because like you were saying, if that's the way that you're going to approach it, especially like if you're an MMA guy, right, and you're just kind of so used to putting in those strikes invariably that kind of killer instinct mindset is the very thing that's going to get you killed against a weapon because you you may not even recognize that you've been cut four times right absolutely i mean you will be walking into a knife literally now i've i've interviewed four law enforcement officers who have been stabbed and the the the, the theme that they have is that they have these suspects they're looking at him they're visually inspecting him and uh, they can't see a weapon. So they go in for an arrest. And suddenly this, 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 this suspect fights back. All they see is a punch. That's all they see. They see a punch and all they feel is a punch. And this is common to the four people I spoke to. They see a punch, they feel a punch. Then they struggle, struggle, struggle because they're trying to restrain the guy. They're not trying to beat the crap out of them. And suddenly they either felt something warm and wet or some people said, I felt something cold and wet. And then suddenly they see blood. And they think to themselves, my God, how did I hurt this person? I'm just trying to arrest them. I'm trying to restrain them. They didn't even realize they were stabbed. They just saw this blood. And then they, then they realize they got stabbed. And then shock gets into, you know, get, takes over. 
And in the four scenarios that um, I interviewed this, the, these people, that was the exact story I got. So, you know, a knife is lethal, but a knife has to hit a lethal target. If I stab you in the arm, if I stab you in the leg, it will probably not take you out. And if it was you, um, knowing you with your mindset, with your skills, you could probably still keep fighting. But if I take that knife and I puncture a lung, or I hit you in the heart, or I get a, uh, for more, uh, a carotid artery, you, that will take you down. But again, because it takes time to bleed out, you will still have that few seconds to fight. So that's the thing that you have to keep in mind with weapons in that if it's superficial wounds, it, depending on how aggressive or how, how psyched up the other person is, they will keep going. But again, it can take one stab to kill someone. Um, sometimes the police gets me in to do expert witness reports. There was one time where I was called in, there was a murder where this guy stabbed this person just once, just once with a, a, a little fishing knife. It, it was a Mora knife. Stabbed him on the uh, the left side uh, of the body, and it just punctured the heart, and it, it killed him, just the one stab. And yet I've been in situations where there were so many slashes, but the guy survived. So, again, a knife is lethal, but it has to be accurate in its targeting. And this is all the things we keep in mind when we're sparring, you see. Like, you know, will it put the person down? Will they continue? Hence, in, in, another, in, 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 in another mindset, it doesn't mean that you, you slash your, your sparring partner once or you stab them once and you stop. You keep going as well, but you try not to get hit. You know, you see all these Filipino martial arts tournaments. There's no defense. One person is hacking away and the other person is hacking away. They're both hacking away at each other. There's just no defense. So if that was real machetes, both would die. See, when I, 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 I am mindful when I'm sparring to give a hit but not receive a, 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 a hit as well. And I think that is the big thing that is missing with people who train with weapons, that you try to attack, you try to restrain, you try to defend without getting stabbed. I mean, how, how many knife defenses have you seen where the knife guy goes in and after about six stabs, they managed to get control. They managed to get, say, a baseball grip, or they managed to take the person down, subdue them. But they've already they've already been stabbed six times. Sure. <laughs> so I guess I guess at the at the same token, right? I mean, there is the other side of this where we need to look at. All right, there's a situation where suddenly I do find myself against a person that has a weapon. Um, and and so that's kind of the, the kind of the next point that I want to go to is that you don't have a weapon, but this other person has a weapon. So I guess the one the one thing to discuss there is exactly what you said. If if is absolutely no choice, and I have you know this person comes at me, they start using the weapon. There's no other thing that I can do. I still also still need to have that mindset that even though this person there's a weapon in play, just because they're able to stab me or slash me, unless they're able to, as you noted, hit a primary target that's going to take me out, I still need to be in a mindset that this thing is is survivable. Oh, absolutely. Because if you don't have that, you will die. You see, you will die if you get, if you get stabbed and you're you're looking at it, you're staring at it. I'm like, my God, I got stabbed. You're going to die because there's going to be another one. One thing about a weapon attack, it doesn't stop at one. It's a shark frenzy. It's a shark frenzy. It's, it's, it's not like, you know, it's not like those sucker punches. It stops at one. For some reason, a weapon attack, there will be a second, third, fourth, or a fifth stab. I don't know why. It's just, it's just the way it is. For some reason, once they get that stab in, they go into a shark frenzy. Hence why it's so important not only to control or monitor that weapon, but also deliver a, uh, a, dis a disabling shot. So th that's the hard bit. You cannot go fully defensive. You cannot go fully offensive. What you need to do is defend against that weapon so you don't take a shot, but at the same time deliver a shot that will either stun or stop him. 
And that's the hard bit. No, it is, absolutely. I was thinking there just where you were talking about the shark frenzy and that you know when somebody uses a weapon, they use it multiple times. Would you say that maybe the reason why that tends to occur in that way is the same thing we were, you were talking about early on? I mean, the person might be using a weapon, but how many times in their life have they actually used a weapon? I mean, how many times in their life have they decided, I'm going to pull out a blade and go and stab somebody? So I think in the back of their mind too, they're not entirely sure what it's actually going to take with this weapon to stop this person in front of them. Oh, absolutely. Because I think what happens is, is this. They go for a stab, but they're kind of half-hearted about it, and they hit you in a non-vital spot, arm, leg, or whatever. And then suddenly you react, and you're still standing, and they start panicking. And I said, my God, is he still standing? So he goes for a second shot. And then the thing is, he still misses the vital points, and you're still standing. And by this time, the person that's got two stabs is really enraged. The adrenaline kicks in. They go crazy. Now they start fighting for their life. So now it's just a total desperate scramble on both parties of a fight for life. It's not a fist fight anymore. It's a fight for life. And hence why I think the guy just keeps stabbing. You know, I've got to put this guy down. And the other guy's trying to, try, to, trying to, you know, to survive, trying to live. And I think that's why it's messy and ugly. And I was just thinking there too, you know, you know, bearing in mind, like you were saying, you were, you were talking to those police officers and they didn't even know that they got stabbed. But let's say if you, yeah, so let's say if you're lucky enough, let's say you're lucky enough, you, you pick up on the fact that there's a weapon in play, you don't have a weapon. Um, would you say that this kind of strategy is a good strategy? Because this is the way that I think about it, being, you know, what I would consider a non-weapons expert, but immediately I would think, okay, if I saw a weapon, the first thing I would try to do is I would try to put some kind of distance between myself and this person, put some obstacles in the way, be it, I don't know, man, pull in, you know, chairs, whatever I can in the way, and then try to find an equalizer. And when I say an equalizer, you know, if I can't find a, a, a weapon of equal value, so say a blade, maybe, uh, I don't know, a, a, a two by four. You know a, mean, a, chair, like a chair is actually a good equalizer. Yeah, or a chair, you know, put that in the way. Would you say that that's a, that's a good strategy to take? I mean, as far as if I saw it and I wanted to survive it. Absolutely. Improvised weapons. Absolutely. Anything. Because the thing is, this is an exercise I do with my students. Okay, let's do knife defense. And, you know, we have the rubber knives. We have the, the, the fake knives. And they'll do the moves perfectly. Then what I'll do is I'll take a Stanley knife, a really sharp Stanley with one-ish blade. And I'll say, okay, this is real. And I'll show them. I'll cut them the piece of paper. Then I will start slashing slowly. So even, not even fast, just slowly. And just saying, okay, just be careful. Engage. Try to restrain me. You know what? Psychologically, they're not going to do it. Because their flesh is now, their flesh is now going to get cut if they make a mistake. However, if you've got an inanimate object like a chair, like a stick, like a, I don't know, your T-shirt, a flexible weapon, that will engage that knife. And if it gets cut, well, it's not going to hurt you. And I found that psychologically, if you pick something up or if you put a barrier. You, you, you are more likely to effectively engage in that knife defense. I like that. that. That makes a lot of sense to me because, you know, as you were saying that, I was just thinking back and I don't know if you saw it, you might have seen this, but there was a video on YouTube. It looked like it was somewhere in one of these uh, um, Eastern Bloc, you know, ex-Eastern Bloc countries. And a guy had pulled out a knife on somebody. He, he obviously, he was able to see it. He was making distance. This guy was coming at him. He, he then saw a two by four that just happened to be on the floor. He picked that up, put that in the way between him and this other person, was able to actually beat him back with it. Ultimately, he knocked him out with it, right? And so in that sense, that piece of wood that day saved his life because if that wasn't lying there, had, had he not been aware and, and noticed it and picked it up or thought about that that was a viable strategy, he would have been dead. No, and no, absolutely. And you know what? YouTube is full of it. YouTube is full of that examples. YouTube is full of examples where um, uh, a person will hold up a, a, a chemist or a shop and then the, the people there just pick up anything like, you know, brooms and stuff and start whacking. And in, in some ways it's very comedic because the way they're whacking them in actual fact doesn't really hurt because they just, they just don't know anything about it and they're just kind of whacking away at this guy, but then he'll just run away. 
you know, t- just do something. <laughs> I think if a guy really wants to murder you, really want to kill you, like in, in prison, like where they do hits or where they do prison shankings, that's the serious stuff. You know, very hard to stop that because they've, they're organized, they've done it before, they've got a certain um, uh, routine that they follow. But street hold-ups, shop hold-ups, I mean, they're as scared as you. So if you just fight a bit, if you start throwing things at them, if you start hitting them with something, hopefully they'll run away. And you, you see this in, in, in YouTube all the time. Yeah, I think also, you know, we forget that even though this person has a weapon, they're still a human being. And in that sense, they also have the same kind of physiological you know, changes that happen in a violent situation as we do. They also have that survival aspect of themselves. So when they feel, for example, they're on the losing ground, they, they're going to want to back away. They're going to want to you know, try to survive it, right? So if suddenly you start throwing things at them, they're going to pick up their hands. They're going to try to avoid it. They, you also kind of shift their focus. So their, their focus now shifts away from purely on you and using that weapon to, hold on a second, there's stuff in the way and, and now I need to deal with that first before I can even think of getting to towards this target and and oftentimes you know when you think about people when they're in these kind of violent situations like holds up and stuff like that like you said it's it can be comical at times because it's so uh, all over the place right it's almost not very well thought out and you can kind of see that where i think like what you what you noted was that in a prison the difference there is that these guys have a a, a, a kind of a system down they've the, the, probably the person who's doing the stabbing so to speak has done it multiple times and so in that sense he's got he's got really Real world experience, which makes him probably the, the the biggest threat. And so, one of the I guess the, the the points of that is, don't be stupid, live a good life, and don't go to prison. So you never have to deal with that. Yeah, absolutely. And in that scenario, it's pure ambush. It's pure ambush. They're just there to kill. Whereas, uh, uh, in a hold up situation, it's kind of more. He doesn't really want to hurt you. Just give me my money, and I'll get on my way. You know, but uh, again, different mindset. Well, another, uh, we're talking about mindset. If you, you are the victim, obviously, you, if somebody pulls a knife on you, you're going to be taken aback because you're not really expecting it. Then what you need to do is you need to turn into a predator. Like if you look at, you know, nature channels with the predators, with the lion stalking, with, you know, the tiger stalking, they're crouched down. Like, you know, wait forward stealthily and you could see that it's you know, basically it's like the crazy monkey posture. You know, they're, they're crouched down, they're moving forward, they're ready to pounce. So if somebody's going to hold me up, obviously at first go, I'll be, you know, in the defensive. But then when I wrap my mind around it, I turn into the predator. Instead of being the victim, I see this person with a knife as, as, as my prey. I have to, because if I have to engage him, my mindset has to be like that. I can't be the victim. Yeah, I think that's really interesting that you note that, is that um, what I talk a lot about when I'm teaching, especially when I'm teaching in a game, I talk about how you, know, how you hold your body matters more than what you think. And really your body attitude is the way that I describe it, right? So when you're thinking about that lion and that he's stalking a potential prey, he's, he's putting himself into a particular body attitude that allows him to be effective when he needs to move in order to achieve success against that potential prey, right? And so that's kind of what you're saying, right? Is saying that you, you need to think about you know changing the, your body attitude to now deal with the situation. And by changing your body attitude, you're going to change your physiology, which in turn is going to change the way that you think about that experience. I mean, it doesn't mean that you're not going to be still shitting yourself, but ultimately you have to turn into that kind of mindset of saying, you know what, I, I now am in that mindset of whatever goes down, I'm going to survive this. Absolutely. And you know what, uh, and that's what weaponizing yourself does. Like when you're unarmed, the guy's armed, you, you, you feel really exposed. But then if you find a metal bar, or if you find, I don't know, or even an umbrella, and you're holding that with two hands, and you know that can be a shield against you, then you've got something. And you know that this stick, this umbrella, that point of it, you can actually now shove into this guy, and you know it's going to hurt. Well, that, that changes everything. That changes, that, that changes the odds. You see, I'm now the hunter. I'm now the that's that's how I go into it. I am now the hunter, and the thing is, normally I would run, 
But what if you've got your family there? What if you've got your small kids there? You might run faster than them. It, it, what if your a gang has cornered you somewhere and you can't run? Well, that's where you have to fight back. That's where you have to turn predator. That's where you have to turn hunter. You see? And it's all a, it's it's what you said. It's all a mindset. You know. I tell my guys, look, it's gonna hurt. You're gonna get cut, but the chances are you're gonna live through it. I mean, you see people in, in, in wars and battles, they get shot, they get limbs blown off, they still survive. So if this person pulls out a knife, even if you get stabbed, chances are you're going to survive that. Why? Because you're in the city. Why? Because you can call for an ambulance. Medical help is, is fast. Medical help is advanced. So chances are you're going to survive it. So you might as well fight for it. And that's what I tell uh, especially my women students, especially my wife. If a person pulls out a knife and wants to take you into that car, you better make your stand right there and then. You better make your stand there where the, the public can see you, the public can help you, rather than get taken to this car, driven like two hours away in an isolated spot where no one will find you, no one will hear you scream. Out in the city streets, if somebody wants to kidnap you, I tell them, make your stand right there. Okay, you might get shot, you might get stabbed, however... They're going to leave you on the street, ambulance will come, medical help will come, and, and you will survive that. So it's a survival mentality. But you just have to make that decision. There's also that, yeah, there's also that part of it, when you're using that example that you just said now, is that the whole point of using a weapon is that you feel that that gives you more control over somebody. And so when somebody doesn't respond the way that you expect them to respond because, you know, you're thinking, I have a weapon, they're going to respond like this by being submissive and being, you know, you know, for lack of a way of describing it, a victim, and they're not they're not responding that way that affects the the attacker the person who has the weapon right that, that affects their mindset as well and so that changes the game for them because they're like okay now this is a problem i was hoping i was just going to pull out this weapon and this person would go quietly now that they're not going to so now what and he might not even have thought even further than than just holding you up and pulling you into a car right and now all of a sudden he's got a fight on his hand and that's the last thing that he wants absolutely absolutely it's especially look especially if there's if there's five or more of them, uh, look, there's no way I can punch one and put them down straight away unless I'm really good and really practiced. But you got, you got to understand, I'm now scared. I'm now off balance. Chances are I probably won't, I probably won't punch as effectively as I do in, in you know, in, 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 in a training environment. However, I, I do this experiment. I, I, I tell my guys, okay, I'll, um, I'll get the neighbor who's nine years old. I'll get him to punch you, and you, you take that punch, okay? And obviously, the, my nine-year-old neighbor can't punch hard enough to hurt him. Okay, I'm going to get this nine-year-old neighbor, and I'm going to get a ballpoint pen in his hands, and I'm going to get him to stab you in the eye. Even if he's nine years old, even though he's a lot weaker than, you know, than an adult, that nine-year-old stabbing the person in the eye, that's going to be effective. That's going to be effective. Which means that if I even have a ballpoint pen, my strikes are now going to be amplified and more effective than if I'm just punching with my fist. Okay. Is it, to me, a weapon is an equalizer. And that, that makes perfect sense, which kind of leads into... I guess the next thing that, that I was thinking about was that, you know, this the side of the, I guess the moral side of it. In the, in the one sense, you know, you are teaching people how to defend against a weapon or utilize a weapon, but there's also that moral aspect to it, right? And I think this never gets discussed. And I see, like, it's almost like people who teach weapons have a complete disregard for the consequences of applying that weapon, right? And so, you know, of course, if you find yourself in a life and death situation, you want to have that weapon on you, or or maybe even, or like you said, you're outnumbered by five people. Uh, you know, having that weapon might then make them decide that they don't want to take you on. But you still need to make that decision, that moral decision, if this is going to be justified in what you're going to do next. And I think that doesn't get really talked about, right? You know, I make that easy for myself. I do not engage in any fight, not one. You know, I've I've, I've been. If you look at me, I, I don't look like a guy that can fight. You know, I'm, 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 I'm Asian. I'm overweight. You know, I wear glasses. I'm kind of happy-go-lucky. 
There's nothing about me that can tell you that I can fight. So it's, there's been times where a gang of kids have picked fights with me. There have been times where my wife and I were walking in the park and four men comes up and, and, and threatens my wife saying, look, and, and gives in detail what they're going to do to her, you know, once they beat the crap out of me. You know what we do? We just walk away. You just walk away. In, in every fight scenario I've ever been in, I've managed to walk away. But the thing is, that one time where I can't walk away, where they've surrounded us and they've trapped us and there's just nothing I could do to walk away, they've pulled out the knives, that's the time when, you know what, I'm glad I've got a weapon or an improvised weapon. I'm glad I know how to use it. So as my general rule, and I tell this to all my guys, do not engage in any fights. Do not engage in any arguments. And how do you do that? You just walk away. You just walk away. Yeah, and part of that, and part of that is making, yeah, and part of that is making this distinction that I always, you know, talk about on my blogs. I say, well, is this really the situation you find yourself in? Is this really self-preservation, or is this ego defense? Because ego defense is completely different to self-preservation. It's exactly it's ego defense. It's exactly right. See, the thing is. And the nice thing about the way I train is I don't have to prove whether my whether I can whether my stuff works. I know it works. I know but the thing is, it works so well that if I use it, my next point of call would be a police station, right or wrong, I'll be arrested in Australia, right or wrong, I will front a court, right or wrong, it's gonna cost me legal money to defend myself because of this country. Now I I could be let off as self-defense. That's a very rare thing in this country. So I know for a fact that if I engage in a fight, it's going to end up in a long, costly legal battle with probably a sure chance of me ending up in jail, even though I'm in the right. I'm talking about Australian law. Oh, but I mean, I think this, I think what you just said is, is, is important, right? Because, you know, what I've done is kind of like an informal, uh, I don't know, research on my own to see, okay, I've looked at the world map and I look at where these quote unquote reality based self defense schools pop up, especially the ones that are teaching, for example, extreme knife fighting and stuff like that. You know, they just go completely overboard, right? And you've seen these guys. And where do they show up? They show up in the middle to upper class neighborhoods of the world. Nobody wants to talk about it, but that's the fact. They're not in the war zones. They're not in the barrios. You know what I mean? They're not in Soweto like in South Africa, in Johannesburg, in, in a township somewhere. They're in the middle to upper class neighborhoods of the world where exactly what you've just described is going to happen to them if they go overboard. Because in, And also now we live in a world where everybody has a camera. Everybody is filming everything right and so this is one of the things i say to people i say okay so let's say you're in a situation somebody you know picks a fight with you you try to get yourself out of it you're not the person that throws the first blow but the other person does you go into some kind of defensive mindset you you, you come back with some offense you're able to knock the person down but now you've been trained that a lot of these reality-based self-defense guys do this and they put this shit out on youtube that scares the living crap out of me if somebody did it where they say okay the put you've you've Take you know you've put the person down, but now I'm going to continue. So let's say you're in that mindset, and now you boot the guy in the head. He falls backwards, lands on the edge of a pavement. Now you know he's got brain damage. He's in a coma for the rest of his life. I said, you know, good luck trying to get out of that in, in the Western world where we have a, you know a, a legal process. You're going to be you're going to be basically locked behind bars for the rest of your life. What started off as self preservation could end up you being the person that's now you know stuck behind bars so you went from you know being the victim to be now be seen as the attacker the aggressor because you decided to go that one step further absolutely and it's a real thing the fact is just pulling out the weapon that's an assault you know it's, a, it's an assault charge in this country you pull out a weapon it's an assault charge and that's it and it's uh, the thing is Using weapons is uh, the social stigma against it is really bad. So you've got the public against you already. Look, uh, uh, unless it's a terrorist attack, you know, just just don't just don't engage. Just just walk away. It's not worth it. It really is not worth it. You know, I promised myself. I wa I promised myself. You know, I wanted a peaceful life. I wanted a peaceful life. Walking away from trouble gives me a peaceful life. Okay, engaging in it 
you know what? That doesn't give you a peaceful life. But I think that that, that also, yeah, that also, hey, Ray, that speaks to being a true martial artist right there, right? And I think that's another thing that, you know, again, never gets discussed is that what people don't realize is that if you're doing martial arts of any kind, especially something that's real and you're doing it properly for the right reasons, it's kind of a paradox. You might have gone in, you know, afraid, um, you know, wanting to learn how to protect yourself, but coming through that experience, coming out on the other side, you now find that you, because you're now very well aware of what the consequences are too, you're like, you know what, actually, I'm less likely now to get into trouble than I was before I stepped into this place to learn, quote unquote, how to fight. Yeah, and you know what, that gives you awareness. Like, but you, you now study your environment. You're not walking blindly, just looking at your mobile phone, texting someone. You're walking along, and you're 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 scanning in front of you. Okay, that guy looks. You know, that guy looks suspicious. Okay, that guy goes. You don't go to places where you can get ambushed. Yeah, it's just it's just awareness. It's just pure awareness. That's what it is. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an important point because that's what training allows, right? It allows you to develop that awareness where if you, ha- if you didn't have that training, many, many times you're not even going to be aware of it. I mean, I can give you an example, right? I mean, just, you know, in, I live in Johannesburg. It's a, it's a violent city. It's a dangerous city, you know? And, uh, you know, even though I live in a relatively good area, my neighbor has actually been hijacked twice already. And Part of, part of the reason why she's been hijacked twice is because she is so unaware of her environment. And it's, it's amazing that you can live in a country where you know that, that the, the chances of being hijacked is relatively high. And you still are not aware of your surroundings or at least you want to actually you know, find a place where you can learn more about learning how to defend yourself. I was actually having this conversation. I, th- I find this kind of interesting and, and maybe you have some, some ideas on this, but uh, it's so interesting to me that uh, I was talking to a guy named James Smart and uh, he's a first degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He's a, a Gracie representative. He's down in Cape Town, really nice guy. And w- we were chatting and we're saying, because we both teach self-preservation um, you know, aspects of our program. And we're finding it really interesting that in a country like South Africa that is so violent, that actually when you put on an opportunity for people to learn to defend themselves, nobody pitches. It's kind of interesting. Oh, look, it'll never happen to me. It'll, we used, my wife and I used to teach women self-defense, but we gave up because no, it's, like, it's like, oh, it's not going to happen to me. I think, that's, I think that's part of it, but maybe, maybe also I find that South Africans have kind of almost resided themselves to this kind of futility of like there's nothing I can do, where the, interest, the, interesting, part, the interesting part of that story is that the irony is, is that the, where you find the biggest self-defense market and the biggest self-defense schools are, again, in the very places in the world that actually don't really need it. <laughs> that's true. It's true. It's true, isn't it? So it's just really weird, you know. So you're living in a country where you really need to learn how to defend yourself, yet very few people actually go out and seek self-preservation uh, training. And then you're living in another part of the world where you you left your keys in your car and you came back out of the store an hour later, it would still be there. You know, that kind of experience. That's the way that you live. But yet, you know, the, the reality-based self-defense schools are huge and massive and have hundreds of students. Yes, 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 yes. It's Catch-22, isn't it? It is totally a Catch-22, you know. Another thing that I saw, and I wanted to get your opinion on this because it really bothered me. And of course, there, there, there are people out there that, that have programs. I mean, you have a program. There are other people that have programs where um, they teach, quote unquote, the average citizen on how to protect themselves against a weapon. And I saw um, quite a well-known group on, on, on Facebook, actually. They put this video up. It was in the public domain where they were teaching other people, how to, how to defeat other people's self-protection knife systems. So for example, let's say that you have a specific process where you teach your students on how to defend themselves against a blade. This group were actually taking that information, but now throwing it around and showing the person who has the knife how to defeat that. And this is what I'm saying about where I think this moral grounding seems to be missing in this industry where people don't fully understand or comprehend that aspect of it is that it's almost like it's a, a free for all and nobody really gives a shit about the consequences of what they teach, but also what, how that's going to end up, right? And that was kind of scary to me. Like, why would you be doing that? Why would you be teaching somebody with a knife who, 
you know, in the public domain that if you've pulled out a knife um, against an unarmed person, you likely are not the victim. And now you're showing people how to actually defeat if that person who was unarmed knew some kind of self-defense against a blade, how to defeat that. That's very scary to see. It's idiots ever, isn't it? <laughs> and look, and, and here, you make a good point here. See, there's a lot of these systems that, that go against people. I go, oh, this is the average attack. What's an average attack these days? There's YouTube. It's what you said. There's YouTube where they teach you how to, how to, um, you know, uh, ma make other systems obsolete. People watch UFC now. People watch MMA now. Who's the average fighter? You know, the average fighter now, they know, they know how to do a double leg takedown. They know how to mount. They know how to ground and pound. In the days when we were kids, the average fighter just did a, a normal haymaker. You know, that was the average fighter. They just do one haymaker. But now the average fighter actually knows how to fight just because of the exposure of UFC, BJJ, and, and even you look at the choreogra choreography of movies now. You know, it's, it's just more complicated. So people get exposed to that. And, you know, the, the, the old haymaker is obsolete. People do a lot more. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I guess, you know, to, to end off, though, is, you know, what, what advice would you give people? Like, let's say I was a, just a, a, you know, a person, I, I'm worried about the weapon aspect of, of you know, of, of coming into play in a situation where I might have to protect myself. Where would you say is a good starting point for that person? You know, what would be like kind of stage one? Okay, look, uh, if somebody's going to attack you with a weapon, chances are it will be either an underhand stab, you know, straight up underhand stab, or an overhand downward stab, or a slashing attack. Okay, so that's, that's basically like one, two, say three, four angles. Downward, one, upward stab, two, uh, slash to the left, three, slash to the full, uh, slash to the backhand slash. So four angles of attacks. Just learn how to defend against those angles. This is what I love about Crazy Monkey. You have the Crazy Monkey defense, and where they call, they throw you a, 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 a jab, cross, hook, uppercut, it's the same thing. So basically, learn one or two or three techniques that will defend against those angles, and learn one good strike. I like my my basic defense against the knife is one or two entries and just one one counter attack. Um, and, and just perfect that. And, and, and just perfect that. And just perfect. But, but the better, better defense is awareness and getting out before they actually engage you. You, you kind of can see if someone's out for trouble most of the time. Okay? Most of the time. You can feel trouble brewing. If you are aware, you can feel trouble brewing most of the time. Get out before it escalates. That's that's the best advice. If you're not there to get picked on, you're not going to get into a fight. I love that. And I think what you're also saying is if you're going to take that next step and go and get some kind of training, look at it objectively. And if it's the more complicated it is, the more unusable it is, right? So then you know you can't use it. You want to look for the simple solution because in the, the heat of the battle, so to speak, you're not going to have time now to deal with, com with the complexity of trying to apply complex techniques. Your body's not going to let you do it. Your mind's not going to let you do it. So you want to go to some simple solutions, kind of high percentage moves, and just stick with that. And then ultimately, that will see you to hopefully through this situation and you come out the other side and you're alive. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and uh, I teach people a different way. With, um, with civilians, I teach them to defend and escape. Defense. So if you take a stab at me, if I have an improvised weapon, uh, a chair, a tray or something, an umbrella, I will fend it off and escape. Not fend it off, then beat you to the ground and kill you. Fend it off and escape. If they chase me and they catch up and they go for another strike, fend it off and escape and run away. Run, run to where it's crowded. Run to where the people are. Run to where those officials are. Again, if you catch up to me, chances are you're going to get tired of it and you're just going to let me go. If, if your motivation is robbery, okay? Revenge and, you know, killings, that's different. So with civilians, I teach them to fend and escape. Because if I fend 
engage, knock you out, stomp on your head, that's going to be caught on camera. And guess what? You're going to be in court. But if I, if you stab at me, I fend and I run away, and that's caught on camera, what, what does that say? You know, self-defense, self-preservation. And people, you know, unfortunately, as you know, right, that, that's not the, I guess, the, the, the kind of the, the fancy Hollywood way of dealing with it, right? And so I think this is where the problem is, is that there's, there's been this kind of, um, people have kind of lost themselves in the Hollywood way of dealing with, with situations where there's a weapon involved and stuff and not really fully understanding the, the reality. And what you're saying is the reality. I mean, that, that to me makes a whole lot more sense. Look, it, it's, it's not, it's not fancy. Um, you know, it, it's not, maybe not great for your ego, but it gets you out there alive. And if we're talking about self-preservation, that's the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to be able to live, to tell the story. Yeah, and sometimes in seminars, I, I, I do an exercise where I have everybody stand on one side of the room and they've got their partner with the knife. What they have to do is get to the other side of the room and touch the wall. Uh, whether they run away or – and chances are what, the, what will happen is they're kind of wary, wary, walking around, walking around, and the guy with the knife will lunge. And usually it will just be one, one parry, one fend, and then they'll be able to reach the, the end of the wall, which is the escape route, you see. It's very hard for a knife fighter to engage when the person's running away. No, I mean, I've, you know, again, you've probably seen this, right? It's interesting that you say that because, again, I remember this, watching this YouTube video. It, was, it looked like it was somewhere in, in, in an Asian country where there were knives involved and a, a, one person decided to stand his ground and just got basically blitzed with the blade. Another person made distance and kept running away and exactly what you said, that person ultimately with the blade lost interest and that other guy was able to get away. So one person, one person probably, you know, you know, if he didn't die, he's going to have wounds that are going to now bother him for the rest of his life. The other person made space and was able to get themselves out of there. Yes, no, it's, it's true. And, and you've, you've, got to, um, you, you've got to make the distinction of self-preservation or martial arts. You know? martial, arts you learn, you, martial arts, you learn how to engage, how to control, restrain, take down, kick. Punch, block, whatever. Whereas in the street, self-preservation. You never see a rabbit stand still to fight against a fox. He's always running. He's always running. You don't see his. You don't see a zebra stand still when a lion chases after him. That's real life. That's real life. Okay. Maybe if they catch, maybe if the lion catches up, they'll kick him, but then they'll keep running. Exactly, exactly. So Ray, listen, man, awesome talking to you. We're almost on the top of the hour. I think we we covered a lot of ground, man, and and uh, you know it was fantastic catching up and hearing your point of view. And um, you know, let's put it out there and uh, see what the response is, and hopefully we can do it again soon. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for the phone call, sir. Awesome. Thanks, Ray. To find out more about our sponsor, Crazy Monkey, go to crazymonkeydefense.com or to become a trainer, check out mastercrazymonkey.com. Until the next show, get out there and write hook life.